All right, all I wanted was, hi, this is Kath Bollard, and that's, thank you, Jeff, and thank you for inviting me. This is really a big honor and um, a privilege, and I'm really going to talk about, oh, T-cell therapy for lymphoma, but where we're going um, with that and just sort of using lymphoma as the model, because as you heard, um, from Jeff, you know, I got in this field uh, with uh, in the field of EBV-associated lymphomas at a time when I presented at ASCO in 2001, and the room was empty with, except for my buddy and the other speakers. And then I just spoke at ASCO uh, on Sunday, and the room was five times this size and completely full. And I think that's, you know, where the field has come now, um, that suddenly us, you know, people that thought, people, you know, honestly, I think oncologists thought we were like voodoo scientists and physician scientists. And now I feel we're at a time when T-cell therapy actually does have broader recognition and, and this is a time of broadening applicability of the, of the field. So I am going to focus um, this talk um, predominantly on antigen-specific T cells, but also we, I can't give a T cell therapy talk on um, uh, lymphoma without mentioning uh, CAR T cells. So hopefully this will be uh, a journey. Um, and I also can't give an immunotherapy talk without acknowledging the fact that T cell therapies are only one piece of, of the bigger field of, um, of immunotherapy and, you know, if, if you include antibodies in there with checkpoint inhibitors, et cetera, vaccines and other cell therapies, you know, I think we shouldn't be looking at any of these therapies in isolation and if we are all going to get to the ultimate goal of um, enhancing uh, chemotherapeutic agents or enhancing drug therapies, then we have to look at immunotherapy as a multi-modality um, approach and not just as a single therapy. Um, so for those of you who are not T cell aficionados and um, didn't come from the lab that I did at Baylor where I was told that T stood for terrific. So um, for those of you who weren't privileged enough to be there, um, just what we're talking about is either taking blood from the patient or the um, patient's bone marrow donor and doing some sort of manipulation in the laboratory and then reinfusing back into the patient. And the advantage of T cell therapies over, for example, antibodies uh, are that they can sequentially kill a multiplicity of target cells. They can recruit additional components of the, um, of the immune system. And technically, they should be able to migrate through extravascular walls and really ex, um, extravasate and penetrate um, uh, the core of tumors, for example, solid tumors or EBV lymphomas, et cetera. So just again, what is a T cell for those of you who are not sort of immunologists? I think it's important to recognize that a T cell has to recognize its target. Um, this is a physiologic um, response. I should, um, we haven't gotten to the engineering yet. Um, through the native alpha beta TCR or T cell receptor. Um, and then you have to have the co-stimulatory moieties engaged as well to get uh, T cell activation and proliferation. Um, and once you have this engagement, you then get perforin granzyme B release and, and ultimately uh, tumor death. And that's the CD8 um, T cell response. And once you have this engagement with the CD8 T cell and either your tumor or your virus infected cells, you, this will also enable the illicit to be able to elicit cognate help uh, from CD4 T cells, which will also help um, uh, CTL activation and expansion in vivo. And we know, um, based on uh, studies, very early studies that came out basically from Stan Riddell's group in Seattle, that you do need this CD4 help if we're going to have um, long-term persistence of our adoptively transferred T cells in vivo. 
So this is sort of a video to show what we're really talking about. Here's a tumor cell in the middle and all these little T cells around engaging with the tumor cell and then releasing perforin granzyme B and killing, killing the tumor cell. And then the T cells are then activated to go off and kill another tumor cell and another tumor cell until they um, can't find antigen anymore. Um, so, you know, when I sell it like this, it sounds really great and, you know, why was it that when um, we were presenting in the early 2000s that no one had zero, you know, people had pretty much zero interest in T-cell therapies and it was this problem really that it just took months to make these cells and thousands of 96 well plates, you know, would go in the trash and, and, and you know, it just was, to people that were interested in drug therapies, this just seemed way too cumbersome and, and, and just, you know, really not really feasible for treating um, large numbers of patients. But last century, there were these pivotal studies that came out of Seattle with the use of CMV T cells, um, the use of EBV T cells pioneered by Cleo Rooney and Helen Heslop when they were at St. Jude's, and then Fred Falkenberg um, started some work uh, with leukemia-specific T cells um, for patients post allo um, so it has been this sort of long winding road to successful T cell therapy and these are sort of where we were last century with the um, importance of not only these pr uh, proof of principle studies but the importance of incorporating both CD4 and CD8 T cells and then I antigen identification. And then I just, you know, it's really been this century that the field has exploded and I've highlighted areas where I personally have been involved uh, in the in this sort of the growth of this field, not only from targeting multiple antigens and single products but priming naive T cells and then obviously T cell engineering including with chimeric antigen receptors. Um, so just to sort of put this into context as we start launching into these different tumor uh, T cell types, you know, here we have our tumor cell or EBV infected cell and we, we will talk about the chimeric antigen receptor T cells where you genetically engineer a T cell to redirect specificity to extracellular antigens, in this case CD19. Um, and essentially you're making a T, rendering a T cell do something it's not usually meant to do, so it's something non-physiologic, where it's now going to recognise a tumour cell like an antibody and kill it like a T cell. Um, but, you know, we've had T cell therapies around for, for quite some time now in the form of donor lymphocyte infusion. And for solid tumour um, uh, people amongst you, you know, I, I would probably put the TILS in this category as well. Um, as sort of a more readily available product, but non-specific, um, but does have a high potential. Um, although we can talk about the pros and cons another time with this approach. Um, and then what I will focus on also is this multi-antigen specific T-cell approach where you're essentially expanding or priming T-cells uh, to specific for multiple different antigens in a single product. So while each T-cell will only recognise one because you're growing up a, a whole polyclonal um, uh, batch of T cells, you will that product will recognise multiple epitopes within multiple antigens. Um, that the advantage here is they will do this. Um, we, they will be able to recognise intracellular antigens because this is recognised in the MHC context through your native alpha beta TCR. Um, so you do technically have a wider number of antigens available to you for targeting compared to, for example, the chimeric antigen receptor um, strategy. And then finally, I'm not really going to talk about, other than here, the TCR, transduced T-cell approach, but here you're basically genetically engineering a T-cell with a artificial T-cell receptor that recognises the tumour, it recognises one epitope of one tumour-associated antigen in an MHC-restricted manner. Um, so the 
problem I have personally with this approach is the pressure for the tumour to undergo immune escape of epitope loss is very high. And as you'll hear, antigen loss is a problem with this approach. So uh, it will be potentially even more of a problem with this approach where you're literally just targeting a single epitope. So <clears throat> we'll start with the antigen specific T cells because as I was saying, and as Jeff said, this is how I got into this field, looking at EBV-associated um, uh, uh, cancers. And I went to Baylor not only because Helen Heslop is a Kiwi and could recognise my accent and understand me without a dictionary, um, I, they, their pioneering work with um, third uh, type 3 latency tumours, i.e. the post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorders, post-ALO, um, really was one of the pivotal studies from last century. But as you can see here, this is a highly immunogenic tumour. It is developed in patients who are immune suppressed, so you have very little, if any, tumour immune evasion strategy. So it's a great tumour uh, to uh, respond to adoptive T-cell transfer. And so it was a couple of years ago now, Helen and I published a review in Blood on this approach of uh, generating donor-derived EBV-specific T cells from for patients with PTLD or at high risk for developing PTLD post allo transplant. And of the 555 patients published, we saw remarkably little graft-versus-host disease uh, with a 91% success rate. And... Um, only 14 failures, which was of which only one was uh, actually a death from PTLD. The others were all rescued. Um, and a very low incidence of CRS in the order of um, just over 1%. So actually pretty remarkable efficacy. So when I arrived, I was very interested in Hodgkin's lymphoma and as a pediatrician particularly interested because of, as we all know, especially in those days, we were still using combination chemo radiation. I mean, us pediatric people still actually do do that, but we are acutely aware <coughs> of the long-term side effects, especially in the um, pediatric population. And depending on the type of lymphoma, up to 40% of your patients will have EBV-associated lymphomas. The problem is we're now dealing with this um, type 2 latency tumours. So this tumour, because it's developed predominantly in an immunocompetent host, has many more tumour immune evasion strategies that it employs, not least of which, as you can see automatically, is downregulation of the number of EBV antigens on its surface. But nevertheless, LMP1 and LMP2 are potential T cell therapy targets. So in the original studies, um, Steve Gottschalk, Karen Stratoff and I developed different strategies for engineering these LMP specific T cells by using adenoviral vector transduced antigen presenting cells. So whether they be dendritic cells or EBV transformed B cells, uh, we genetically modified these cells to express LMP2 alone or LMP1 and LMP2 to stimulate and expand an LMP specific T cell population from these really heavily pretreated patients uh, with uh, Hodgkin lymphoma and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So in the patients that we treated um, with, with active disease, and I should say none of these patients received lymphodepletion chemo, so they didn't receive any chemo, they just got our T cells. And with that, we're seeing a 50% disease-free survival at two years in these, this chemo refractory population, where in those days, um, because it was generally before the checkpoint inhibitors, you would expect at two years progression-free survival to be more in the order of about 30%. So this um, read here seemed um, promising. And even more so in the adjuvant setting, giving these cells as adjuvant therapy, predominantly after autograft, um, especially when you compare with the CIBMTR data where it should be around 60%, here we're achieving 90% um, PFS at two years. And we did this all with no toxicity related to the T cell therapies, no um, CRS. Um, I haven't shown you the data, but this was actually also in the JX Med paper where we were gene marking these cells and did show accumulation of the T cells at the disease sites. And we did see anti-tumor effects. 
So where is this um, approach going now? Well, the Cell Medica is a UK-based company who are looking at this uh, product for licensure in EBV-associated uh, NKT cell lymphoma of the nasal type, of which 90% are EBV-associated. And then I'll talk briefly about what we did uh, as a next step with um, rendering these cells resistant to the tumour microenvironment. So that brings me to this picture, which I love and hate, but um, I got this from uh, Christian Steidel from Randy Gascoigne's group in, um, in Vancouver, and you know, it, he gave it to me not so long ago, but there was a similar picture that was given to me when I first started in this field, and I was like, well, why am I doing T-cell therapy for lymphoma? There is no way our T-cells have a chance. And, you know, the rationale was, well, if you take the T-cells away from this very immune-suppressive microenvironment, then, then you can you know, reverse the energy and then you put them back in. But it still didn't make much sense to me because you're still putting them back into this whole immunosuppressive milieu. And, you know, so obviously there are some of our friends here like the PD-1 expression, antigen down regulation, things like that, that can be overcome. But TGF-beta comes up a lot and it's certainly a ubiquitous approach to suppressing the immune system employed by most human cancer. So this was really something that I was very interested in because TGF-beta has devastating effects on T-cell proliferation and function, cytolytic function um, in vivo. So in the original studies, um, uh, Claudia Rossig and I generated a retroviral vector um, with a truncated dominant negative receptor that we obtained from um, Michelle, um, Joanne Massagay at Sloan Kettering, where basically you've got the wild type receptor here and then a truncation after the intracellular domain, so you've got no downstream signaling after ligand binding. So we put that into a retroviral vector and you can see here transducing our LMP specific T cells, we get reasonable transduction efficiencies, which then then translates to function in vitro. So here you have a non-transduced T cell, um, and then you add TGF beta, and they just don't proliferate. Whereas if you have your transduced T cells and you add TGF beta, they are still proliferating uh, as you would expect. And when you take supernatant from Hodgkin lymphoma samples that are rich in TGF beta, you see the same preservation of proliferation in vitro. So we do, did this in a mouse as well and saw that our mice that um, uh, were given the TGF beta resistant T cells did not grow to tumors at the same rate as the, t um, or, or did not clear their tumors, uh, that cleared their tumors significantly better um, than in um, mice that did not get uh, anything or mice that got mock transduced um, T cells. So we then went from um, bench to mouse to man, and um, I'm skipping obviously many years of work and pain and whatever, but that's fine. Um, and so we treated eight um, patients with EBV positive um, Hodgkin lymphoma, and all of them had relapsed opposed some sort of transplant procedure, and this patient had relapsed after allogeneic stem cell transplant, and so for this patient only, we generated the product from his healthy donor who was his brother. Other. Two of the patients had previously received, uh, been on our other study with just the LMP T cells and all refused additional chemotherapy. So none of what I'm going, nobody received any chemo and this, they only received the T cells. So this was um, one of the patients who received multiple doses of T cells and you can see prolonged persistence of the TGF beta receptor uh, T cells in her peripheral blood. Um, this was the patient who was post allo and it doesn't show up that well, but he had um, relapsed in his spine. He was actually a skier for your US ski team and was actually diagnosed when he was in New Zealand 
um, because he was skiing on the off months because as you know we have winter when you have summer and um, actually was um, uh, if you've ever been to New Zealand you know it's the could be the most coldest place in the world um, because we don't do central heating very well at, or at all actually and so he was like really hot and sweaty and all his ski team member were under you know 10 sleeping bags and of course he was having his B symptoms so was diagnosed down there and by the time he got to me he'd, fa he'd failed an LO, failed DLI, um, had failed radiation and was still posit biopsy positive for his Hodgkin lymphoma and really had been told to be, you know, start palliative care. Um, so he came to us and got several doses of our DNR transduced T cells and we saw a dramatic persistence of the T cells in his peripheral blood and ultimately um, complete remission uh, of his disease. And this was him getting his last dose of T cells at Baylor just before I left and, um, and this was him just um, a couple of weeks ago gave me a picture of his new baby. So that was really exciting to me. So. Um, um, and then this was another um, woman on the same trial. She had not had a good, re a complete response with LMP T cells alone, and then got the DNR transduced T cells, and is now remains um, in CR for over um, actually now seven years. So on this study, we saw five um, complete remissions. This includes one continued complete remission that we only treated one patient as adjuvant on this study, one PR, and we had two stable diseases. Um, so certainly, it's, it, and with the gene marking component, we know that these cells are persisting long term um, and so may be beneficial in this setting. Um, where we're expanding this approach to, though, is not generally in the Hodgkin field because of the development of checkpoint inhibitors, et cetera, this space has become quite busy. So where we're looking at expanding is at Baylor, we had trials using TGF-beta-resistant T cell, CAR T cells for lung cancer uh, and melanoma. And we're now looking at brain tumors and neuroblastoma, actually um, based on this work that we just published um, genetically engineering NK cells to be resistant to TGF-beta as an off-the-shelf therapeutic for pediatric solid tumours, including brain tumours. So that's what's sort of in development right now. So obviously, um, I hopefully I've convinced you that these sorts of T cells do have potency um, in certainly the EBV lymphoma setting, but there is no doubt that the first LMP T cell study was cumbersome in terms of manufacture because we were using gene engineered antigen presenting cells, we were using EBV transformed B cells which can take months to manufacture, and so some of these patients, you know, it was taking up to three months to make these cells which is clearly not um, feasible. So what, um, what we're now doing, and this um, is work done by multiple groups, including ours and Cleo Rooney and Anne Lean, is using um, overlapping peptide pools, generally 15 amino acids long, overlapping by 11 amino acids, to pulse antigen presenting cells um, with these chopped up peptides um, and then your T cells will recognize within the context of MHC but you don't, because you're um, spanning the whole antigen, uh, you can generate these cells from people irrespective of what their HLA type is and you're able to elicit both CD4 and CD8 T cell responses. So what um, Cleo's group did at Baylor is also used artificial antigen presenting cells as the expansion step. So this is the latest um, EBV T cell product where you pulse your dendritic cells with overlapping peptide pools for these four EBV antigens that we know are in those type 2 latency tumours. And then now this three month manufacturing process has been truncated to 12 days. So really a much um, more rapid manufacturing strategy. And what that seeing is um, similar efficacy to what we showed in our original LMP CTL study that, that particularly targeting um, uh, NKT cell lymphomas um, and you can see here is a complete remission in one of those patients. 
Um, but that's still not completely off the shelf. And um, obviously, we're still, the T cell field is still competing with antibodies, which are truly off the shelf. So, how do we make T cells? truly off the shelf. And this was a concept pioneered by Dorothy Crawford in the UK, who had these banks of EBV um, T cells. And um, what, you know, and so we have a similar bank. And so if we have our EBV or LMP specific T cell product, and we know the HLA type of that donor, so here is the HLA type here, and we know that the EBV specific activity of that product is through B8 and DR15. That means that if this patient comes to you um, with PTLD and they have uh, B8 allele, then we can give this product to this patient because of that one shared allele. Similar here, this patient's even better because he's got two shared alleles and both um, uh, have the EBV specific activity. So we, there have now been several studies published using this sort of off-the-shelf virus-specific T-cell concept, not only for PTLD, but uh, the multi-center study that I led with um, Anne Lean and Helen Heslop um, targeted CMV, EBV, and adeno. Um, and then the group at Sloan Kettering, um, in collaboration with a company, Atara, a uh, focused on the EBV T cell product uh, in um, PTLD. And you can see pretty dramatic um, responses in these patients that really have to be refractory to other therapies to get on these um, studies. And um, certainly for our study, um, you can see that we in the EBV setting, we're achieving a CRPR rate of around about 70% um, and 74% and overall. So, you know, remarkable given that there was no toxicity associated with this approach, and yet we're still seeing efficacy. Um, and when these cells really work, it's pretty impressive. So this is um, data that Susan Prokop showed me, uh, shared with me from Sloan Kettering, showing pretty dramatic clearance of um, CNS, PTLD. And this is a patient that we treated um, from the NIH who had um, CNS PTLD, who got two doses of the third party virus specific T cells um, with not only complete neurologic recovery, but also obviously complete remission. And I was very heartened when Rick sent me this picture of him and the patient one year later, completely uh, neurologically normal. So really does speak to the efficacy of this approach approach and the fact that they get into the CNS and um, without toxicity. So based on that, Mike Keller in our group is um, leading a, a, um, multi, a national effort through the PBMTC and the PIDTC to use third-party virus-specific T cells for pediatric patients who with viral infections post stem cell transplant, and then also patients with P, um, primary immune deficiency uh, with viral infections um, as a bridge to get them to transplant. Um, so we have the bank, the study is open um, to all PBMT study uh, centers and is starting to enroll now. Um, similarly, um, Berta Wistinghausen and I, um, along with Lauren McLaughlin from my group, um, is running a COG study where we are giving third-party LMP-specific T cells to pediatric patients with PTLD post-solid organ transplant. This study is open and rolling. We've treated four patients so far. If you are a COG site and you don't have this open, please open it because this is the first complex biologics T cell therapy through COG and if this fails um, uh, yeah it, it will be five years of my life wasted but also I do worry that um, COG may not want to you know embark on this sort of venture again um, so then that's sort of the EBV um, side of things, but obviously not everybody has an EBV associated um, lymphoma. So what do we do about them? And this was work that I started in, at Baylor with Anne Lean and um, Russell Cruz from my group was also involved with this of generating um, T cells um, specific for multiple tumor antigens. And it's just like what we did with the EBV antigens. So same peptides, 
chopped up, uh, but spanning now antigens that we know are expressed on the um, lymphoma cells, uh, most of them being cancer testis antigens. So generally we do two dendritic cell stimulations in the presence of cytokines to stimulate and expand um, multi-TAA specific T cells. So this was um, work by uh, Ulrika Gerdeman, who showed that she could generate um, T cell specific for five tumor specific antigens in a single product from patients with lymphoma. And then in vitro, she showed that you could not get clearance of lymphoma cells um, when you co-culture just with a DLI type product versus when you give with the TAA T cells. So showed some evidence of cytolytic activity in vitro. Um, and so then going in vivo, this was a study that I was originally the PI of and then George Karam took over when I left, um, basically showing that if we gave these cells as adjuvant therapy, um, the majority of patients remained in CR after autograft and T cell therapy. And of the patients that we treated with active disease, we saw 50% CRs Five of those patients were actually Hodgkin lymphoma, with one being a diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. So certainly it seemed like there was greater potency in that Hodgkin lymphoma setting. So when we moved to um, uh, Children's National, we started a study, which we didn't want to completely compete with what we were doing at Baylor. And so this is a study that Kirsten Williams is leading and that she'll talk about later today called Resolve, where the main focus is to use these cells as rescue therapy after aloe bone marrow transplant. Um, and so this was work that actually was started by Garrett Weber when she was with me, to, that showing that you can prime multi-tumor antigen specific T cells uh, from the peripheral blood of of healthy donors that can then potentially be used in this setting. So Kirsten will show um, the data today, so I don't want to completely steal her thunder, but you can see in blue, these are the patients who had already relapsed post allo and then received um, the TAA T cells that were derived from their same bone marrow donor. And so you can see here that automatically there seems to be a signal in AML, and when you look at um, over Overall, just in the AML setting, um, even accounting for the three continued complete remissions, um, we do have an appreciable number of complete remissions with an overall response rate of around about 60% in the patients who have already relapsed post allo who then get our T cell therapy. Furthermore, she showed in the first pediatric patient who had ALL, who had previously um, failed Blinner tumor mab and already had detectable disease post allo, um, even with being on desatinib, um, got our TAA T cells and for the first time went to undetectable levels. Um, and so she will show you um, the persistence data and the data showing how um, we can track our unique T cell uh, population uh, in vivo of these patients. Um, but I also wanted to show you what we're doing in the solid tumor setting, and especially since Amy Hotellin, who's the fellow running this study, um, soon to be faculty member, just had a baby last night, so couldn't be here to present her poster, so um, this is a shout out to her. Um, but you can see here, so she's giving the same product. Obviously now it's um, derived from the patients themselves, so it's targeting WT1, Prame, and Survivin. And when you can see, if you specifically specifically focus on dose level three, um, the majority of these patients are still um, without progression. So they still have um, lesions that we're following, but there's been no progression except in this one patient here with Ewing sarcoma. And we have one patient on the um, dose level two who's, who's followed out for quite some time now. So when you look at that data, when we're looking at time to progression, for the dose level three cohort, we can see that our time, I need to just read it, pre, you know, our time to progression when you, for their previous treatments was five months and we're still in the post TAA T cells, we're at almost at seven months and counting. And then if you look at all the patients who are still with no progression after 
um, after two months, then really you see no progression in that group. And then this was them with previous T cell therapy. Uh, their medium time prog to progression here was six months. So I, I think this is an interesting signal. Um, do I think that TAA T cells alone for solid tumors is going to be the way? Um, no, but I think it's a good enough signal that would want us to then combine with other agents such as checkpoint inhibitors in this setting, especially since we're achieving these results again with no toxicity. So this is um, what uh, is a summary of the TAA T cell um, approach. And um, we certainly have um, good success at making these cells from healthy donors even, um, and that we have um, got certainly safety and, and in our early evidence of efficacy data in the heme malignancies and also maybe the solid tumor setting. So then finally, um, the chimeric antigen receptor T cells. and. Um, Interestingly, I started in this field, one of my first papers actually was gener generating CAR T cells for neuroblastoma with GD2. Um, but really, this has really exploded um, since um, we started uh, looking at the CD19 CAR T cell approach. And so if, if if the um, New York Times and um, what and wherever has not educated you well enough yet, I'm just going to fill in the blanks. But um, that what basically to remind you, a chimeric antigen receptor is uh, where we take the single chain variable region of a monoclonal antibody, obviously here CD19, and engraft it through a hinge or spacer domain onto a co-stimulatory moiety, followed by the TCR zeta chain. And so this whole construct here is the chimeric antigen receptor. Um, so then that chimeric antigen receptor is then cloned into a viral vector system, typically a retroviral lentiviral vector or a non-viral vector system. This was predominantly um, looked at initially at MD Anderson with Lawrence Cooper, um, but I, I will really focus today on where things have gone with the retroviral and lentiviral constructs. So once you have um, your uh, lenti or retro vector, you then transduce your T cell which you can see here is expressing its native alpha beta TCRs. So you're now transducing your T cell, so it now expresses the chimeric antigen receptor, and now you can see that T cell is now able to recognize CD19 on the tumor cell so and killing it. So as I said, recognizing uh, the tumor like an antibody and killing it like a T cell. So in the original studies, the neuroblastoma studies, um, and the original clinical studies in CARS were done by Mike Jensen when he was still at City of Hope. And yes, in vitro, you saw this killing of the tumor cells, but when you put these in people, there was basically zero persistence, zero efficacy. And the problem was because in those days, we were using these so-called first-generation CARS, which lacked the co-stimulatory moiety. And so when you don't have that co-stimulation, you get incomplete activation and persistence of the T cells in vivo, and that went for, you know, that sort of correlated with zero efficacy. So Michelle Satellane at Sloan Kettering initially published this work in 2002 where he added a co-stimulatory moiety, the CD28 co-stimulatory moiety, and basically was then able to show in mice improved T cell activation and proliferation. And then almost 10 years later, and this is a study that I was running with um, Carlos Ramos at Baylor, um, we showed the same in people, basically. So we gave um, the same patient, got first generation and second generation CD19 CAR T cells, and we showed only the, um, the second generation CAR T cells persisted in vivo. Um, so this is sort of what I'm trying to show you, um, the difference between this first generation and second generation uh, car here. So I quite like this slide that Michelle Satellane gave me because I think it puts it into context now that we have several licensed products available. Um, and I think it is important to understand the differences and 
and the similarities, essentially. So the original um, CD28 car construct came from um, Michelle's lab at Sloan Kettering, and this was one of the project, um, products that Juno were looking at licensing. Um, the NCI product that is now um, the Kite Gilead licensed product um, also uh, came out of this sort of um, deriv derived construct, but which, with a different single chain. And the car that we had at Baylor, uh, similar, but a, but a different hinge region. Uh, the St. Jude's car uh, was developed by Dario Campana and had the 41BB co-stimulatory moiety. Uh, it was this construct that um, Stan Riddell based uh, this car on, which is what Juno is going to li for licensure for. And then this, the same uh, construct that Carl June uh, took to licensure through um, Novartis. Um, so... But, you know, originally with all these different car constructs, everyone predominantly was focused on ALL and CLL. And really the only person at the time when all this madness started who was focused on lymphoma was actually Jim Kockendorfer when he was with Stan Riddell and um, Stan... Um, Steve Rosenberg at the NCI. And so his original study was um, giving a very prescribed lymphodepleting regimen um, followed by CAR T cells and um, in the early days with IL-2 because sort of based on the TILS platform. And, he, and Jim was the first person to publish the success of um, CD19 CAR T cells and it, this was in blood uh, in 2010, and this was a patient with follicular lymphoma who you can see had complete clearance of his disease in the bone marrow post uh, lymphodepletion and CAR T cells. Um, and so he went on and showed then in a very aggressive pa uh, patient population um, that he was getting some pretty remarkable durable um, CRs um, from using this approach. But the problem was, Although you got very good um, responses to pretty bulky disease, um, all of his patients ended up in the ICU, and obviously you had some grade five toxicities, which is um, pretty unacceptable. So he went back and then looked at perhaps at decreasing the lymphodepleting regimen, and so truncated the whole flu side regimen down to only three days and got rid of the IL-2. And when he did that, um, and this was published in JCO last year, you can see that he's still seeing pretty um, dramatic um, responses with an overall response rate of 73%. And now only about 50% of his patients are at, uh, ending up with SAEs, no grade five toxicities, and all toxicities resolved in, in two weeks. So really um, improved the toxicity profile of this approach. Um, and interestingly, um, you know, I think w where we do want to see more, certainly in the adult lymphoma field, is what is happening with the mantle cell and follicular lymphoma patients, because in general, the focus has been on the um, diffuse large B cell lymphomas. Um, so then the group in Seattle were very focused and still are very focused on really understanding the T cells that they're transducing. So based on work that Stan had done in non-human primates, um, they, they use CD4 T cells and CD8 um, central memory T cells in the majority, although some patients just get CD8 T cells. And they mix these at a one-to-one -one ratio, CD4 to CD8 ratio, then they transduce, uh, and then they give the patient lymphodepleting chemotherapy followed by CARS. So this was their original study that they published in Science Translational Medicine a couple of years ago. Um, and again, mostly diffuse large B cell lymphomas. I would say talking with this group versus um, the NCI group, the performance status of this group was appreciably lower uh, than the patients that were enrolled on Jim's study. Um, but it, nevertheless, they still had very impressive um, overall response rates, um, although they did still have um, severe toxicities, including two deaths. Um, and what they did show, um, and you know, I, I'm, I'm still a little perplexed why 
uh, they did this given that Jim's data looks so good, but they originally just treated their patients with cytoxan lymphodepleting regimens, and when they did that, you know, they really saw very little uh, expansion of the CAR T cells in the peripheral blood. And then when they added fludarabine, um, they now got markedly greater expansion of the CAR T cells in the peripheral blood, and that correlated with a better overall response rate in this group compared to the all-comers. Um, so there have been now multiple CAR T cell, CD19 CAR T cell studies published in the academic setting, uh, including City of Hope, NCI, Baylor, Seattle, Moffitt, uh, and UPenn, and Sloan Kettering. Um, to put you all out of your misery so you don't have to read all these, it's a total of 115 patients with an overall response rate of 70%. So it's quite interesting across the studies, it's all pretty consistent in this setting. Um, but I think where it's getting really interesting is when we start putting the company studies head to head. Um, so here we have the Kite study versus the Novartis versus the Juno study. And, you know, I don't think the drug companies like me showing this slide too much, but um, this is the data. This was presented at ASH and I updated, you know, I had to weed through all the abstracts and that, but updated it from ASCO too. And at six months, the overall response rate across the studies is all looking remarkably similar in the order of about 40%. And where it looks like there are maybe differences is in the CRS with the Juno groups reporting only 1% CRS, but actually they grade their CRS differently um, in that uh, grade two, uh, grade three, um, sorry, grade Grade three, so if you have hypotension on inotropes, then you are a grade two CRS, um, I'm not sure why, and in the others, you're a grade three. So if you put in those hypotensions on inotropes in this group, then it'll all be pretty similar. Um, so I think it's really interesting that um, despite the differences in the cars and how they manufacture, that probably we're all very similar across the board. And there is one thing for certain though that we, I think we are better than standard of care. And this was presented also at ASH by uh, Satva Nilapu and Fred Locke, um, that if you look at those patients on Scholar 1, and I agree it's an unfair comparison because there's patients enrolled here that would never be eligible for a CAR T cell therapy. Um, but, you know, obviously the overall response rate here um, is appreciably lower than what we're seeing uh, in the CD19 CAR T cell studies. But I think, you know, more data, longer follow-up is needed. But what was coming out of ASCO was that it seems like if you got, had a response, certainly by three months, but definitely by six months, then that in 80% of the patients, that was going to hold hold true for at one year. So I think it's really important that we keep following these patients long term, even though these products have been licensed. Um, and then, you know, there's no doubt there's toxicities associated with these strategies. And I draw your attention to these key publications um, in the field of um, CRS and defining, uh, treating and preventing. I think we're learning more all the time about preemptive therapy and um, understanding uh, the neurotoxicity a bit better. But, you know, we've still got a lot of learning to do in this space. And so I think it is really important that we, there is open sharing between studies and um, and getting together as, as groups and consortiums to be able to make an impact. Um, but there's no doubt that with these large trials, we really are, and now it really truly broadening applicability and I think it is an incredibly exciting time for our field. Um, I, I don't want you to go away though thinking that there are no issues remaining with CAR T, CD19 CAR T cells because I think there are and you know we don't talk that much about managing the prolonged B cell depletion which is a problem in particular with the C, uh, 41BB cars because they do seem to persist longer than the CD28 cars and Let's not talk about this issue um, yet, because obviously this is going to be a problem, I'm very sure. 
Um, and then, you know, at the moment, the cars that are in licensure have murine portions to them, so there is still an immunogenicity component um, depending on your HLA type. And there are humanized cars in the clinic right now, but they're not the licensed products. And then an immune escape through antigen loss is, is a real issue. And Cameron Turtle shared this slide with me, and across studies, of the patients who relapse, 40% are relapsing with CD19 negative um, uh, disease, as shown here. So what to do with those patients? And so in the CAR T cell therapy field, there are multiple studies now looking at other CAR uh, targets in the, in the lymphoma space, including CD20, um, Kappa that came out of Baylor, CD30 that also came out of Baylor. Um, Baylor have also just started a CD5 um, CAR T cell protocol for um, T cell lymphomas, including lymphoblastic lymphomas. So, you know, I think there are um, certainly strategies for B cell lymphomas that could help mitigate uh, and this lo antigen loss of CD19 loss. Um, so this is my second to last slide. So this is, you know, hopefully I have given you the full array of T cell therapies for lymphoma. Um, I did, as you say, as you know, focus on CARs and multiple antigen-specific T cells. I think, you know, it is important to appreciate that there are differences, um, including the fact that the CAR T cells are expensive currently. They require gene modification, more regulatory oversight. They can only target an extracellular antigen. But their biggest advantage is their potency with in multiple large number of trials that has led to li licensure. But we shouldn't ignore the adverse events uh, and adverse effects associated with this therapy. The multi-antigen specific T cells certainly are cheaper um, with more rapid manufacture, less regulatory oversight. We have more antigens um, open to us because you can target intracellular antigens um, and the toxicity profile is markedly less than with the gene engineered T cells but really although that we're seeing efficacy or a read of efficacy in boutique studies there's really been not much traction in larger numbers of trials because of a lack of pharma interest. So I think it is interesting time and um, we will continue to watch this space, but, you know, no matter what happens, I think, you know, certainly CAR, CD19 CAR T cells are already licensed. What happens to the multi-antigen specific T cells, we'll see. But where to, you know, whenever, if everything gets licensed, where are we actually going to best use these cells? And I think this is still a question. And I'm sure if you're talking to a drug company, they'd like to use them right up here, up front for everybody. Um, but, you know, is that how we should best be designing our next um, uh, clinical trials? And I think that that's something as a, a field we have to really think um, deeply about. Um, but ultimately, where I see the vision is, you know, we come in initially with um, maybe chemotherapy, certainly small molecules, antibody therapy, and then come in with our cell-based therapies at a time of more minimal disease where you can mitigate some of the toxicities uh, and affect uh, a cure. So on that note, I would like to firstly thank um, all many of the leaders who grew up with me in this sort of cell therapy field who um, uh, shared their slides with me, especially um, my friends and colleagues at Baylor. Uh, and then I would like to acknowledge um, the group at uh, GW and at Children's who also shared slides with me. Uh, and then obviously um, I would like to call out Patrick Hanley, who's our GMP director. So all the studies that we showed you today, none of which would be possible if his team who are um, listed here and are also here in the audience. Without them, we would have no products to administer to our patients. Uh, and then I would like to thank Kirsten Williams um, and Amy, who are leading the TAA T cell efforts, and Melanie, who's developing the TAA T cells for brain tumors, and then all our collaborators uh, locally and, um, and further on. So thank you very much.
Hi, I could run from Georgetown University. Two quick questions. One, once you put these CAR T cells, how long do they survive? Are we talking CAR T cells? Or, yeah. So it depends what type of CAR T cells. I have no idea. Yeah, Are we right. talking so weeks, months, or years? Could, could be years and could be months. So the, for the CD28 CAR T cells, it may only be not months up to nine months. For the 41BB, they still can detect them in some patients for for four plus years. But there's exceptions on both sides for that. But that's the... And is there any evidence of the chimeric receptor being expressed in the host cells through exosomes or any other mechanism? Not that I'm aware of. Not that I'm aware of. Very good presentation, Dr. Bonner. Um, this morning, the, giant, uh, the Washington Post had a major feature article on immunotherapy, as I'm sure you probably read. And for the general public, and these articles are, are written for the general public, one would get the impression that uh, most of this research seems to be directed towards uh, cancers that, that impact adults. So my question is, are immunotherapy approaches as effective? Is there anything about pediatric patients versus adults that make this more or less effective? And then also you made, mentioned about Big Pharma. Uh, is, is there adequate funding for this approach for pediatric oncology uh, research as opposed to research directed against adults? Yeah, so I, you know, everything that I showed you today involved pediatric patients as well. So in all the studies, the age range was generally from seven years to 70 years. So we have always had pediatrics um, embedded in the trials um, right at the start. Where we've come into problems more recently is the FDA's resistance to let us do first in man studies in children. Um, which I find problematic, especially when we're trying to argue with them that, for example, that solid tumour study I showed you was mostly paediatrics, and um, you know those many of those tumours are only applicable to children. Um, I think you know certainly based on my experience, um, we haven't had enough numbers to show that there's effort greater efficacy in peds versus adults, but with the CD19 CAR T cells for ALL, um, certainly there seemed to be better efficacy and better safety in kids. And I served on the ODAC for the FDA that approved Camriya in children, and that was the first approval of a cell gene therapy, and it was in kids, which personally I thought was a major milestone for pediatric oncology. So I, you know, where I would like to be is, is for our colleagues at the FDA to recognize the fact that the biology in children is different, that children are likely to more, like, you know, could possibly more benefit from this type of therapy because of their more potent immune systems and, um, and that they should not let us tr wait treating, you know, 10 adults first before we can start enrolling children, yeah. So, um, I don't know if, Kath, you want to comment on this first, but I think a lot of the press that Jerry's referring to is with checkpoint inhibitors, and their tumor mutational burden really yeah. does seem to drive that, and that is an adult phenomenon. So it might be worthwhile spending a moment to discuss the difference between antigen-based cellular therapy and a more nonspecific T-cell uh, activation strategy that checkpoint inhibitors and represent. And I thought what was in the Washington Post was a TILS-based approach, wasn't it? Is that what we... Are we talking about the patients with breast cancer where we took the TILS? Yeah, I think that's what he's talking about. But, but you're, you're absolutely right, Pat. With the, um, with the checkpoint inhibitors, probably because those tumours don't have the same mutational burden that you'll probably see more efficacy in the adults rather than peds. But what we're doing is in the test tube, priming the multiple tumor specific T cell response. So we have a much better 
understanding of what's going into the patient. And, and that is what we think is the advantage of this strategy, as opposed to checkpoint inhibitors where it's a little bit blind, because um, you're relying on it all happening in vivo, uh, and with TILs where you're just taking out a bunch of T cells from a tumour site, and then hoping that what you're expanding is tumour specific um, in a very non-specific manner. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I really am of the dogma we should really understand what we are truly giving these patients from an immune therapy point of view to have a better understanding of predicting efficacy and, and also likelihood of side effects. Yeah. Beta dominant negative. Are you using the the TGF beta dominant negative receptor with your with the uh, multi multi with antigen the TAA specifics? T cell. Yeah. So that is um, that the... is someone's project. I think it's Hema's project on the LLS grant. So yes, that's the short answer. Um, the longer answer is we're also exploring it, as I said, within K cells to make these as an off-the-shelf TGF beta resistant NKs. But but yeah, I mean, I do think the DNR strategy's got got merit, yeah. I would, because it's bi I'm biased. <laughs> Thank you. I'm right on to it, 2.30. So we're going to, we'll take a short break, but I just, for those people who are here that are not um, the, uh, so people who, who, this whole immunotherapy thing, um, it may seem just you know, incredibly blurry and fuzzy, and like when you see articles in the in the Washington Post or the New York Times, um, I'm going to give you three things that you can look at right in the article to help you at least know what category you're looking at. Are you looking at a drug that blocks immune suppression, like the PD-1, the checkpoint drugs? Are you looking at an antibody, or are you looking at a T cell, uh, some sort of modified T cell, which we just heard a wonderful lecture on? So just, if you keep those three things in mind when you see the articles in the press, you'll be able to put those immunotherapy articles into bins that will help you really understand uh, a little better what's going on. We're gonna take just a short break uh, and um, start back here in, uh, 